Cody was a four-year-old male, husky, 88 pounds. He came in probably two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. Torn uh, left cranial cruciate ligament. He's holding it up there. And uh, I recommended, my techs had recommended that we go ahead and get pre-surgical blood work and x-rays. We gave him an estimate on what the surgery would be. He said, you know, I'm not going to do the x-rays or the blood work just yet. I want to go home and talk to my wife, and we'll call back and schedule it. So our intention then was to go ahead and um, put him on Deramax, which is like Prevacox, a COX-2 inhibitor, for a week or so till they made their decision and bring him back in for surgery and do the blood work the morning of, you know, because we can do that with the, uh, the, the Baxis units. So we bring him back in for surgery. We do his pre-anesthetic lab work, and the only thing that's up is a mild elevation there of ALT. But just enough to concern me because I'm thinking, well, the whole reason I'm doing this pre-anesthetic blood work is so I can catch something. So I, I ramped it up then to a full chemistry. Turns out his albumin was low, his alkphos was 464, and his ALT was still around the same. So now I've got a, a problem. <laughs> because if I had been a little bit more adamant about running that pre-anesthetic blood work on that first visit, and said, you know what, let us go ahead and do the blood work before I start him on Deramax. Because now I don't know if his liver enzymes were elevated because he's been on Deramax for six or seven days, or did he have some pre-existing liver condition? I don't know. I should have done the blood work the first day. And that's part of my soft personality and not being so, you know, educating him on, on, the, on the ramifications of that. So we discontinued the Deramax or Deracoxib postponed his surgery. I sent him home on tramadol, gabapentin, and dinmarin. And when I get back, he's going to come in for a follow-up blood work. We're going to see where his liver enzymes are, enzymes, <clears throat> and, um, and then try to get him through surgery. And, you know, if, if they're marginal, we'll probably go ahead with the procedure, but we'll have an aggressive fluid therapy plan. And, um, you know, we'll obviously on a monitor and all that stuff. But, you know, uh, so these are the kinds of things that you'll uncover when you go looking for them. So, why do stuff in-house? Well, that was one case as to why we should do them in-house, to get results on the spot. You know, a little higher patient care, improve, improve client service. Um, you know, you have the opportunity to educate them. Um, you know, it's just a little bit more efficient. You know, it's better for your, your practice revenue and all those things, but it's just good medicine. Versus outhouse labs. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not down on outhouse labs. I just found that cool picture and I thought, wow, that's neat. Because I kid with my staff all the time. They, they'll say, you want this in-house or out-house? I'll say, you know, whichever. But uh, so the ones that go to the out-house, uh, the good and the bad is, you, you know, you often have really good support with out-house laboratories. You, we have, there's a lot of internists on, on staff at the at reference labs that you can get on the phone with and help you with interpretation and maybe some treatment options. Um, then, you know, when we send a sample out, if they still have urine or blood left over, you can go ahead and add on another more advanced test or something on the spot, and that's really convenient. You know, the downsides are you've got delay in re result reporting. Um, um, one of my least favorite things to do, and I love people, but I don't like to call people back all the time and get into these long conversations. You know, the lady that could talk for an hour without a subject from the beginning, you know, you get those on the phone once in a while, don't you? But um, you know, you got to call them back, and that takes your time. And uh, samples can get broken in transit, and then, you know, there's always a holiday or weekend, and you want results back, you know, yesterday. So those are just same, some things to think about. <clears throat> I don't know if we've got any equine guys. Our equine practice, we developed wellness plans, per se, where it's a package deal. And uh, this is hard to read because they're really small. But basically, there's two or three different plans, a senior plan, which does involve some blood work, um, but like we want to get on the farm twice a year and we want to do their vaccinations, Coggins testing, health, rec health papers, um, uh, we want to float their teeth and we've been able to kind of capture back some of the, the deworming market because what we'll do is we do fecal exams uh, also and um, what, what we, our goal was there was to uh, package the wormers and put the date that needs to be given and give that as a part of their wellness. We deliver it at the visit. And so, you know, they are local feed stores, and you know, the, I don't know how it is here, but you know, the, most horse owners and cattle owners deworm their own critters. Um, and so, this was a way we could capture some of that market back, is put it into a wellness plan. But Dr. Walker, my partner, runs that clinic, and we really started these wellness plans back in early 2000, um, but we didn't know how to implement them. 
And finally, a light bulb went off on his head when he saw what we were doing on the small animal side as far as wellness goes. So he started really pushing them. And from 2008, he generated $6,000 in revenue just from selling those plans. Looks like he sold about six of them or maybe six or eight of them. All the way up to this last year, he's 95000 and he's even greater in 2013. Just because he believes. And he's got this in his uh, ambulatory truck. It's this uh, dry erase board that he pulls out. And he teaches clients all kinds of things. And education is a big part of it. And he sells them wellness. And, um, and they love it because they know they're getting all the vaccinations. They know they're getting all their deworming done on time, strategically. It's convenience, and that's what they want. And um, so for you equine guys, there's opportunity there. So this is a part of the talk that kind of supports the uh, not so clinical side. I call it shipbuilding, and it's just kind of a play on words. But um, this is Captain Bravo. Captain Bravo was a famous captain of a merchant ship back in the days of the pirates. And uh, Captain Bravo was uh, named that because of his bravery. But um, he would climb up every morning at, sunset, at sunrise and look out over the horizon. And uh, when he would see a pirate ship coming on to advance and to attack them to get their, you know, all their goods, he would look down at his mates and he would say, bring me my red shirt. And so the crew would bring him his red shirt and then the offending pirates would come on board and they would fight. And uh, Captain Bravo was just well known for being able to fend off the, the pirates and they, they, you know, uh, in battle, he would, uh, they would always be victorious. And so afterwards, uh, you know, they were all cleaning up and everything. And then the next morning, Captain Bravo got up, went to the top, and here comes two pirate ships on the horizon. And uh, he looks down at his men. He says, bring me my red shirt. And so they bring him his red shirt, and they fight. And Captain Bravo leads the charge, and he's out front. He's not leading from behind. He's out in the front of the battle. And his men are just amazed at his bravery. And, and uh, so after they're cleaning up the, all the spoils and all that, um, the men came up to him and said, Captain Bravo, why is it that when we get attacked, you always call for your red shirt? He said, well, he said, if I become injured in battle and I begin to bleed, I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to continue to fight on. And they were just amazed all the more at his bravery and his, uh, you know, his uh, leadership skills. So then one morning they got up and Captain Bravo looked out of the horizon and there were 10 pirate ships coming. And Captain Bravo looks down at his men and he says, bring me my brown pants. <laughs> uh, leadership always has a point at which we get scared. And, um, and that's kind of the shipbuilding uh, story is um, leadership takes a lot of courage. And it takes vision, but you set the course. You know, you, you choose the course for your ship that you're building. And uh, you have to train and release the responsibility. And that train and release is critical with your staff. And this is really philosophical. But if you want to build a ship, you can go into the woods or the forest with your staff, and you can help them cut down the trees, and you can saw the boards into planks, and you can nail them together, and you can build a ship. Or you can develop a leadership principle that simply states what you want to do is just create in them a desire for the sea. And what I mean by that is an 80-20 leadership principle that means let them do 80% of the development of your wellness plan. Because if they aren't, don't have ownership in that, it's going to be a lot tougher to implement it. You tweak the final 20% to what you want. But that 80-20 rule is, 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 is the way to really implement a, a, a wellness plan or any kind of plan or practice policy or whatever you're going to do in building your ship. Ownership, that's where the staff buys into what you're doing. It's really just what I just told you. And then repeat, repeat, repeat. Fellowship is nothing more than two fellows in the same ship. Um, this is Kristen and her little dog, Katie. Dr. Snyder uh, just last week did a Facebook uh, contest on pet lookalike. <laughs> <laughs> And so Kristen's the winner so far. But you wouldn't believe how much community involvement people get on and post pictures and all those immeasurable things. You know, practice managers always say, you know, if you can't measure it, there's no sense in doing it. And I disagree. I think there's a lot of things you do to bond people to your practice and develop that familial uh, atmosphere, the common ground, 
Um, the, you know, those are lots of immeasurable benefits, and we use social media and, um, to do that. And I'll share one more quick story with you. I had a Boston Terrier that came from across the river from another veterinarian that was uh, intervertebral disc disease, I assume. Uh, it was down, and another veterinarian had said, you know, told the guy that they just needed to euthanize it. It would never walk again. And it was a pretty old dog. And so I bring it in the hospital. I do some blood work just as a baseline. I'd never seen the patient before. Um, I put in an IV catheter. We start running some fluids. Um, it had deep pain sensation in both rear limbs, just couldn't stand, and uh, acted you know, moderately painful. And really the pain I thought was up around the neck, uh, more so than, than further back. And you know, I, I did what you do. I put it on steroids in hopes that maybe it would get up. Um, discussed referral surgery in an older dog like that, not really an option for this guy. But he's in Minnesota, which is 14 hours driving from my hospital. His daughter is back home bringing me the dog, and so I'm communicating back and forth. Well, don't you know it, the dog gets up on steroids and fluids, and um, is doing really well. So I take out my iPhone, I click a little picture of that dog standing there all happy, and, and I text it to him in Minnesota. I'm his <coughs> hero, you know. Uh, those kinds of things, that immediate gratification, and that, you know, we take photos now of patients right after surgery, as long as they don't have blood hanging out of their mouth or whatever, you know. <laughs> don't, you don't let your techs or nurses send pictures that look bad. But the value that people perceive by a little bit of communication tool that takes seconds, take a picture, text it to them. So we try to get their phone numbers, email addresses, and whatever, and, and they're waiting at home anxious for results. You know what I mean? So this wellness approach is being able to communicate what wellness is. And so we've, we, we still try really hard to, to work those bonds and, and use technology to do it. <clears throat> then relationship is the most powerful ship. Um, this is where you start to gain influence and high trust. And then it doesn't matter what you recommend, clients will comply. When you have these kind of strong bonds to your practice, um, it's hard to drive them away you know, as well as I do, that you can euthanize a dog and do it properly and be their hero. Those of you have been in practice. Euthanasia is another area to bond people to your practice. And you show them the compassion. We send sympathy cards and everybody in my hospital signs that card for every dog that dies in cats in my practice. They get a sympathy card. It takes a little bit of money, it takes a little bit of time. That I get so many compliments at the grocery store, out in the community. That card you sent was so nice, you know. But all of my nurses and, and receptionists and the doctors all sign every card. It just takes a few seconds to jot down a little note. You know, I'm sorry for your loss of Missy and, you know, you had a great friend and blah, blah, blah. But those are just little things that we do. But anyway, the relationship building, some long-term results uh, and benefits from that. This little blind dog's diabetic. And um, I, we weren't involved in the case early on when his eyes were enucleated, but... Uh, his mommy brings him in for his blood glucose curve, and that little turtle is a backpack, and it has his insulin and his special food. And his mom says, well, he doesn't have any, so he's got a little buddy that's got great big ones. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the kind of things that, uh, you know, this is why we were engaged in practice. These are the five R's, and on my outline, the teaser was, you have to be here to know what these are. And these aren't rocket science. And uh, it's funny, when I was developing this talk, I have like 40 R's words that keep coming up that involve veterinary practice. And I'm just going to develop another talk called The R's Have It. But uh, that's what I'm going to do next year when you guys invite me back, probably. But, um, and I'm taking two weeks, and we're going to travel the country, just so you know. But um, the five R's really help build these relationships, and they help drive compliance, and they help drive revenue into your practice. And you're doing a lot of them already. But I just want you these to be confirmation of what you're doing. And maybe there'll be one tip in here that'll change your life. Your recommendations. You need to walk worthy of the vocation and the profession that you're trained to do. And walk in the authority of that profession. You need to realize your value to the client. And when you make recommendations, you got to make them with conviction. It's one thing to say, you know, we recommend that Bozo gets his teeth clean. Or you say, wow, um, I'm just looking at Bozo's gums. They're really inflamed. And, you know, that bacteria can get into the bloodstream really easy and can cause some heart valve issues and liver and kidney disease. And in small breeds of dogs, it you know, can shorten their life by a couple years. Bozo really needs to have his teeth cleaned. 
So if you, Dr. A did the little speech in the beginning versus Dr. B that just gave you that one, which one are you more likely going to answer yes to? You need to make recommendations with conviction. You need to believe it. And then, you know, you, you almost feel like you're acting. But, but if you believe it, it's not acting. You're just, you're, you're conveying the importance of that dental, okay? You got to believe it. Your staff has to believe it. And, and not to bring uh, Christianity or scripture or whatever, but there's a scripture that says that one man plants, one waters, and God brings the increase. And that just came to my mind because I got to thinking about our model. Our receptionist plants the seed. Our nurse waters the seed. By the time the doctor comes in, it's an easy conversion, right? It's, it's easy to sell it. Um, so that three-tiered approach is really a big part of what makes wellness work. Walk in the authority of your title. They came to you for advice. You didn't go out and drag them into your clinic. They're looking for wellness. Don't prejudge a client's ability or desire to pay for recommended services. This is a walk-in closet for two little girls. If they'll pay for that, <laughs> what will they pay for wellness? This lady gets up every day and dresses these two dogs in those outfits. She washes them and irons them. These are her babies. They're in that 60-year-old clinic that was down the street from me. The reason I got that picture is we bought that clinic in January. And we've implemented wellness. And I get emotional talking about it. But that clinic's exploding now because we're teaching clients uh, about how to, do, how to do things right. It's growing at leaps and bounds. We put an enthusiastic young veterinarian in there. She's got about six years of experience. And she's just changing the world. So <clears throat> I know this thing works. The other R is rechecks. Recheck everything. This is also in the Bible. Thou shalt recheck everything in two weeks. <laughs> Not really, but do you guys always recheck in two weeks? Is there something about, maybe it's the suture removal interval or something, but my point is this. Um, I noticed that Dr. Snyder's revenue was a little higher than mine, you know, and I kept thinking, how does he do that? Well, I started looking. He rechecks everything, you know, every ear case, every, everything comes back in for a follow-up in a, in a given amount of time. And uh, so I learned from him on that, but... It increases revenue, and then there's this exponential increase, and, and then they stop at the little toy area and buy a toy, and they pick up food and flea prevention. You know, you're trying to increase front door swing rate, right? And, um, and how much do you charge for that? Um, you know, some people don't charge anything. Some people charge a full exam. I kind of feel like somewhere in between is where you ought to be. I don't know what you guys do. A follow-up visit is, you know, about half of a regular examination, but that's up to you. Um, now, depending on how much time you spend. Tiered pricing strategies is kind of an idea that Abaxis uh, puts forward because of the way the rotor system works. Um, that CDP is, a, I charge about $85 if I'm doing it for a sick dog or a first time if I'm screening. Um, if they come back or if I use it for a pre-anesthetic and a dog that I, I want more values, I'll charge a little less for it. Or if it's a recheck, I'll charge about $49 if I'm doing it on a repeat. And, um, and so, <coughs> Um, it increases compliance and, and then, um, you know, when you find things, you do add-on services. But because clients are looking for, um, you know, better, better fee structure on that first slide I showed you, I think we need to really look at how we charge. And uh, we don't want to nickel and dime people to death. And we don't want to give things away for free either. But we need to find a price point that helps them comply. And, and even if you, it's a, like a lost leader for that Walmart. They'll do their free prescriptions to get you in the door. You know what I mean? So it's okay to, to adjust prices a little bit on those things to, to, to get the service because you're doing good medicine and you might uncover something and that in turn would you know, generate more revenue for you. Recalls are my, it's my least favorite R because I'm not a phone person. Very painful at times, that's for me. But you, should, you guys should really develop these five R's and have a staff meeting on each R and just strategize on how can we do recommendations better? How can we do recalls better? Um, you know, I have my staff call back my surgery patients. Uh, you know, if it's something that I need to explain to them, I'll call them back. But we, we call back for a lot of things. If, if you put them on a prescription food, you maybe call them back two or three days later and ask them how they're, how they're eating it. Because oftentimes they'll go home and Buffy won't eat it, and then they'll go out to the grocery store and buy something else. Well, they didn't eat that food you sold me. You know what I mean? But if you know it early on, you can intervene and maybe recommend something else or give them a trick to, to help them out. 
So the recalls does a lot of things. It strengthens that relationship. Um, it, it makes appointments. They, they make other appointments when you call them back and see how they're doing. Well, it's not doing so well. Well, we've got to recheck it. These R's feed themselves. Your reminder systems are the lifeblood of your practice. I think you guys probably know that. Pay close attention to them. The larger your practices get, um, the more reminders fall through the cracks. That's from that AHA study. You miss details. And so we remind for everything, phenobarb levels, glucose curves, uh, NSAID monitoring, anything that you can send a reminder for, send it. Weight loss programs, um, everything. Um, and we're starting to try to use some of that technology, maybe text and email, and we try to find out what the client wants, how they want to be reminded. Always tag wellness to your reminders. You know, stress the exam more than the vaccinations. Client recovery is close to my heart. <clears throat> my reception area, I don't like for clients to come in to the reception area and have a person talking on the phone and not greet the client within seconds. You know, there's research on that in human business and all that. So I designed my hospital, the reception area, there's actually three seats and three computer terminals. Sometimes I have two girls up front and, or three on really busy times. But my phone, my operator, the girl that answers majority of the phone calls, there's also a, a, a wall there, a, a, a fake wall or a wall with our logo and all that. And behind that are our files and her desk. She's out of sight. She answers the phone from back there and takes the majority of the calls. And the only time these girls answer the phone is if she's backed up. And gosh, it just makes a big difference um, in, in how clients perceive and how they're welcomed into the practice and all that. But um, anyway, that girl in the back, if she's not busy answering the phone, um, I like for her to start it with Mr. Adams and call Mr. Adams and ask him how Bozo and Buffy are doing. We're updating our records. I just want to see how, how they're doing. I noticed that um, they're you know, overdue on their vaccinations and whatnot. Uh, you know, and you'd be amazed at how many appointments that girl generates. She more than pays for her salary just through the power of suggestion, a phone call. So if you're slow, if your practice isn't at capacity, you could hire someone to just do that. And when they get to Z, they go back to A and do it again. Because by the time they get to Z, things have changed. It takes a lot. Well, it depends on how big your practice is. But um, So we have a phone person just that, that does that. Um, we have them get the new phone numbers, update their addresses, try to get email addresses. Um, it, it shows the clients that you care and it helps strengthen that relationship. All right, change. We've talked about this. It's just, it's, it's not an event. You're not going to go right back to your practices and just implement wellness and, and just have it. But I, I promise you, you can have results and see revenue differences within a few months. You can see differences in your computer on, on your recommendations. But I would suggest that you have strategic planning meetings with your staff. Take them off site somewhere and buy them dinner. Have them build the program, 80% of it. You tweak the final 20%. And it'll take a, time, take a lot of time for you to change the practice culture. But it, I know it can be done. All right, I'm closing with this. Um, Dr. Rotundo is actually a veterinarian from New York City. That He's the one that actually I heard the Captain Bravo joke from uh, several years ago at a meeting in San Diego. But he's well known for high quality practice and all that. But he and his young boy were traveling to upstate New York to go fishing or go so do something. And growing up in New York City, his little boy had never really been out in the country. And so when they got out in the rural roads, his little boy saw a cow standing beside the road. And um, <clears throat> his dad, the little boy said, Dad, look, a cow. His dad said, so? And it dawned on Dr. Rotundo that his little boy had never seen a cow. And it was a wow thing to his kid. And then they drove on a little further, and, and uh, there was a whole herd of cows over in the pasture. And uh, the little boy goes, Dad, look, wow, a whole bunch of cows. And Dr. Rotundo goes, yeah, that's really cool, you know. And you know, he's kind of feeling bad because his kid had never seen a cow. And he's a veterinarian. And uh, so they go over the knoll, and here stands a purple cow. And Dr. Rotundo and his both boy at the same time say, wow, a purple cow. And what that really means is you're not really in competition with other veterinarians in your area. You're in competition with anybody 
in your area in business that does a better job with customer service than you do. You have to continually show people the purple cow or the wow factor through customer service, client service, the, the, the little picture and, and text it, that all those little things that bond people to your practice. So I, I told that purple cow story and one of my receptionists bought a cow and painted it purple and it's sitting on the reception desk and right now it's dressed up in Halloween outfit or something. But, but people come in and ask about the purple cow. And so uh, um, I think we just have to constantly remind ourselves that we need to continually uh, serve our, our clients and our patients. And uh, that's really all I have for this evening. And I appreciate your attention.